the year 1963 brought a new programme to the BBC, which would live on for over 60 years. Michael Barry was the BBC's head of drama at the time, and a man named Sidney Newman was invited to replace him as he was retiring. January 14th, 1963, Newman replaces Barry as the BBC's head of drama. Sidney Newman. Hailing from Canada, Newman had been a producer for the CBC when he was lured to England to fill a similar role at ABC Television. There, Newman made waves, creating such mould-breaking programmes as Armchair Theatre and The Avengers. He was also an advocate of science fiction and oversaw several genre series such as Pathfinders in Space. Newman was then invited to the BBC in December 1962 and on the 14th of the following month, he took over. Newman left his role as the head of drama in 1967 around the transmission of the story The Enemy of the World. Verity Lambert Doctor Who's first producer was a very prized and important role. Newman came across Verity and asked her if she wanted the job, to which she replied, of course. In late May 1963, C.E. Webber was approached to write Doctor Who's first story, The Giant, but this story was abandoned exactly two months later. In June 1963, Anthony Coburn was approached to write 100,000 BC, which would eventually become Doctor Who's first episode. Later that same week, he was commissioned to write The Masters of Luxor, but that was once again abandoned. On the 31st of July, Terry Nation was commissioned to write The Daleks, at the time a six-part story with BEMs, standing for Bug-Eyed Monsters, something Sidney Newman despised. Before the serial was produced, the plug was nearly pulled on it as Newman and Donald Baverstock disliked the scripts, but luckily there were no other serials to put in its place. In August 1963, when Doctor Who was approaching its scheduled filming dates, a title sequence was in order. Using the Hallaround technique, discovered and developed by BBC engineer Norman Taylor, this technique would involve a camera facing a monitor, displaying what the camera is seeing, creating a loop, the visual equivalent of two conflicting microphones being too close together. But let's go back to Doctor Who's first episode, episode 1 of An Unearthly Child, and more specifically, the inception of the time machine that would become known as the TARDIS. In May 1963, C.E. Webber completed the first draft of the Doctor Who format guide, although Sidney Newman took issues with elements such as the Doctor secretly striving against science and his time machine being a void of nothing. This is the first document containing details of the Doctor's travelling vessel. In mid-May, C.E. Webber completed another draft of the Doctor Who format guide, in which the time machine is now described as resembling a police box. Before this, it was to be covered in light-resistant paint, but this was changed for budgetary issues. Another thing changed before the creation of this second document was that the TARDIS was to change its appearance to suit its environment. This was mentioned in the episode The Cave of Skulls in the early film sequences. It's still a police box. Why hasn't it changed? Dear, dear. How very disturbing. Peter Rahatsky was commissioned to design both the exterior and interior of the TARDIS. The police box exterior is the closest to a real police box and is the longest serving prop in the series' history, lasting 13 years. The interior contained a central console with buttons and switches on, and the back wall making up the fault locator. It has inspired every console room to date. The TARDIS would be in regular use until 1969's The War Games, before the Doctor would be exiled to Earth, but more on that in a future video. But now Doctor Who's first episode was to be broadcast on the now famous date of the 23rd of November. But the day before, a tragedy struck. President John F. Kennedy was brutally assassinated in Dallas, Texas. As a result of this, Anna Murphy Child's first part only received 4.4 million viewers. But back to the Daleks now. Designer Raymond Cusick followed Terry Nation's descriptions of the creatures. He wanted them to not look like men in suits and glide, not walk. But even by the point of pre-production of this serial, the all-important Doctor had still not been chosen. After a lot of deliberation, actor William Hartnell was chosen. Before being cast, Hartnell had been in many, many roles in film and TV. He had just been in This Sporting Life before transporting from the big screen to the small screen and was cast as Doctor Who. He was unsure whether to take it, but by the end he loved it. But now let's talk about the format of the classic series. The show would and did consist of mostly four and six part stories and occasionally longer or shorter stories. 
Each part would end in a climactic cliffhanger, which the whole episode was lead up to. For example, in part 1 of An Unearthly Child, after a long and disturbing dematerialisation sequence, the police box, first seen in the junkyard in Totters Lane, now appears on a desolate and apparently alien landscape. Then, suddenly, a man-shaped shadow sweeps across the landscape. For the viewers that watched this episode, it made the following episode compulsive viewing. Of course, the following story features one of the most chilling cliffhangers in its first part. With a brilliant claustrophobic feel of the set and camera work, and with a distinct building feeling present throughout, suddenly a door slides shut next to Barbara, and something approaches. All we see is its plunger and her terrified reaction and blood-curdling scream. Classic cliffhanger. Doctor Who was on and soon became a firm staple of British television. 